This is the Into the Wilderness podcast brought to you this week from South Africa, Scotland, and North America. Our guest is Max Lowe. It's a podcast we recorded when we were in Montana. Uh, I will let Daryl give you the, the full rundown of what to expect, but it was a really fascinating uh, conversation with a very, very interesting man. Uh, I am in South Africa currently. My brother is back in Scotland. I am three or four beers into the last night of seven days of hunting with five guests of ours who had previously been on our wilderness hunts back in Scotland and they were all really keen to try and experience what hunting in South Africa was like. So we put this trip together about a year ago and it's hard to believe I'm kind of now at the end of it. And I, But I think it's pretty safe to say that everyone's had a a really good time this week experiencing new species new terrain new types of hunting it's been a, a real joy to see how, how happy and enthusiastic everyone has been in this environment that's unusual to them but from here i still have three weeks uh, out the country uh, my next stop uh, which is tomorrow is to Durban. I'm going to visit my brother and I's great uncle, who was a professional crocodile hunter for many years, uh, and I'm just going to sit down and hear his stories. I've not seen him for quite a while, uh, so it's going to be great to sit down and just chat with him again. He, he's quite an elderly gent now, and uh, we I always think it's really important to take the time and and hear the these stories before people get you know too old. And uh, it's something I've been meaning to do for too long now and I I couldn't put it off anymore so I'm going to spend a little bit of time with Uncle Ted um, before I go back to Johannesburg and then as many of you will know who are regular listeners to the podcast I'm going to be meeting with the guys on the ground from the African Pangolin Working Group uh, to give the equipment that we've bought uh, with the funds from our Pangolin auction Uh, So if you don't know, in the previous weeks to this podcast, we were running an auction to raise money for pangolin uh, conservation in Africa and through a lot of very generous donations and very generous people who bid on those auction lots, we were able to raise more money than we actually needed. The main equipment that they asked for on the ground was motion cameras and a thermal spotter, which we managed to purchase. And we actually have some money left over. I don't have the exact total amount because they were the auctions were just finishing as I was coming out to Africa. But it's in excess of two thousand pounds. And the extra money we will we'll ask them when I see them in the next few days what else they need. And if there's nothing else that they immediately need, then we'll just make a donation to the African Pangolin Working Group with the remaining money. But I am very, very excited to meet up with these people. Uh, first of all, I am gonna be at the rehabilitation center, what they call the Pangolin Hospital, uh, which is somewhere in Johannesburg. I'm going to be there in the next few days. And then straight away the following morning, uh, we're going to be releasing uh, a rehabilitated male pangolin back into the wild uh, before going further north, almost right up onto the, the northern border of South Africa and catching up with a few pangolin that they've been tagging and tracking. I'm going to be taking a lot of pictures. I'm going to do a lot of filming. I'll try and keep everybody in the loop on Instagram stories. They may be delayed depending on my phone signal and and internet up there. But I'll do my best to let everybody see what's going on. And ultimately, we're going to I'm going to hand them over the equipment. Uh, And I know from speaking to Francis that they've already built in this new equipment into the, the next phase of their conservation. Uh, and study for re-releasing rehabilitated pangolins. So that is really exciting. And it just shows you that you have all made a difference. You know, Everybody who's contributed to that in, in whatever way, even if you never won a bid, even if you just bid on those and, or su- supported it through sharing our posts, it is going to make a difference on the ground. After that, uh, I'm heading to Namibia. Um, I'm not going to tell you uh, what... I'm doing there quite yet, but it is an incredible story um, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a gent who contacted us quite a while ago. 
Uh, it involves conservation and it involves elephants. That's all you need to know for now. I can't wait to get there and speak with Alex, um, who's the, the gent who's going to be picking me up and learning about what he's up to for five or six days before I finally attend the CIC conference before coming home to see my dogs and my house and my girlfriend, who I'm already looking forward to seeing. But uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I need to tell all of you guys. I don't think so. It's uh, it's dark here now. Uh, the day is finished. I think everybody's going to have a few drinks tonight just to celebrate the success of the week. Uh, it was two groups of people. There was uh, three friends and then two friends who came. But I think it's safe to say that everybody is leaving here as great friends with memories that they will never forget. Uh, earlier today, I did manage to catch up and uh, ambush some of them with a microphone to see what they had made of the week just very, very briefly. So hopefully I will bring you that now before heading over to Daryl who can do all of the the good stuff that we normally do like uh, the prize winners and our, our new competition. And I'm going to prompt him to mention an awesome whiskey treasure hunt which is currently going on in Scotland with one of the clients that we work with. Richard, Hello. no, you don't have to put the headset on. I'm going to get you speak, just speaking to the mic. Sum up your week. Has it been what you expected? Yeah, it's been an incredible week. Uh, more than we expected to be on Aspiring. Yeah, it's been amazing. What have you been hunting t- uh, for today? Because uh, we're right at the end of the week. It's our last full day. And you were in search of a rather special animal this morning. Yeah, we were looking for a uh, trophy kudu this morning. Um, and um, whilst we found one, um, it moved on. And... Um, Shortly after a, uh, a nice impala presented itself, yeah, which was a pretty special experience. Has everyone had a good time this week? Yeah, amazing time. Yeah, good. Yeah, You've been, look, been looked after. Oh yeah, it's been five star plus treatment, hasn't it? Awesome. Oh, I'll go and see if I can catch someone else. Rick, I can see you hiding here somewhere, stroking a dog. <laughs> you were trying to avoid this way, so you don't have to put the headset on. You're just speaking to this, speaking to this. Yeah, you can if you want. You hold it very, very grandly, like it's something precious. Uh, how's your week been? Really good. Yeah. Um, you, it's beyond expectations. That's so, what I was um, going to ask you. Did you what? What kind of when? What did you expect coming here, or did you really? Was it just so far out of the realms of the stuff you'd done before? You came with no expectations. Um, I came expecting sort of like a wooden cabin on a hillside, like racks and bunk beds, and um, you know maybe like a, a cold shower if you were lucky. <laughs> and it's certainly uh, way beyond all of that. Yeah, and what has what it been like? Because you, you obviously you were hunting with us in Scotland, with our wilderness hunts, red deer up on the hill, Scottish Highlands. This is Africa. How does it, does it compare at all? Um, there's obviously um, similarities. Like there's a lot of shared ethos with the people that we're with and where we're staying, and very much. Even though we were in a teepee last time. Um, you still came away feeling like you genuinely made friends and that it, you were kind of in someone's home. And I very much get that feeling here. It's like staying with friends rather than being at a lodge yeah, like or a, a hotel. That's yeah. awesome. That's what yeah. it's all about. Great. So you've had, you've had a good time and uh, you wouldn't refuse the offer to come back? No, absolutely not. No, I'll start saving now. <laughs> Great. Cheers, Rick. No worries. And everyone else has disappeared, haven't they? I'm going to go and catch Tank now. He's busy sunbathing. Uh, him and Richard, they're both out by the pool now. So I'll take this for a wander. So we're going outside of where we've just had lunch, and hopefully, if it's not too windy, I can go and I can go and ambush him while he's topping up his suntan. <laughs> Tank. Hi, mate. Tell me, how does this how does this uh, this trip rank for you? In oh, terms of adventures and trips, I've already decided it's best holiday I've ever had. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Second best after the last time I came to South Africa. Tremendous. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So you wouldn't need much of an excuse to come back. No, I'm dying to get back here. Yeah. Hunting experience being what you expected? Oh, it's exceeded all my expectations. Um, I sort of said my blue sky scenario was the uh, the baboon and a big pig, and yeah. I, I didn't think it would happen, but. So, somehow it did. And what was the? Um, actually, I forgot to ask everyone else this question, but 
Well, in fact, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to Richard because uh, we were on a, a bush pig hunt the other day, mm -hmm. which is a really, really exciting type of hunting. And uh, the, the farm that we were on at the beginning of the week and that farm, the primary reason for hunting the bush pig there is because they kill a lot of their, their young sheep. Mm -hmm. And you managed to, to shoot a really big old boar. But what was that experience like with so many people involved and the yeah, dogs and everything? It, it was a really special thing to be a part of. I actually... Um myself and ralph the guide we got posted on um on sort of a distant mountain side on on the edge of everything that was going on and uh, for most of the day i actually felt a bit left out and felt like i'd sort of drawn the unlucky spot where nothing happened but then uh sure enough just last thing of the day this this big monster pig comes running across the valley at me and uh, yeah we had to uh sprint down the hill as fast as we could and yeah, just managed to uh, to sort of plug him on the run at 30 yards. Oh, it was tremendous. Yeah. Richard, just come back to you because I forgot to ask you about this. Yeah, absolutely. Y you and I were going through the jungle. It was like something out of uh, Vietnam in a rainforest there. What was that experience like? Because that kind of hunting with the dogs and, you know, running, chasing after them, they're barking and howling. It's quite unique. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like nothing you could uh, really imagine or sort of prepare someone for, like... As you know, we were halfway up that mountainside, and you you don't realise how steep it is when you when the blood's running and you're chasing after the pig when all the dogs are around you. But then you stop for a minute to check the uh, the Garmin detail, de gear to see where the dogs are, and you look down and you think, if I slip here, it's going to be a long a long way to the bottom. You, you, there there are few reasons to go up a, a mountainside like that in the jungle, and I think chasing pigs is probably about the only one. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of any other good reason to chase to go up a mountainside like that. Well, thanks very much, gents, and uh, I hope we have all, everybody has a successful last afternoon hunting. Thanks, thanks Byron. Mate. So that is that. Uh, there are a couple of guys missing. I'm not quite sure where they've got to. I haven't managed to catch up. Oh, hang on, here he is. Here's somebody hiding. Here's another Richard. We're full of Richards here. I think I've almost gone round. Oh, and dear fun. are you about to disappear, dear fun? Yes. You are. Is that because I want to put a microphone in your face? <laughs> Richard, how's, uh, how's the week been? We've got like half a day left. It's hard to believe that it's... At the beginning, everything was like, oh, we've got loads of time. And now we're at the, the end, world. it's like, where's it going? Yeah, it's, it's um, an amazing week. Um, did not know what to expect at all. A little bit apprehensive, because uh, it's a totally different country, different continent. Different species? Diff yeah, totally What's different species. What's it been like learning all the different species? Because at home, really, it's like, really if you're interesting. going out deer stalking, the area that you're in, there might yeah. be two or three, but that's about it. Initially, it was it was hard. You know, you're out in the bush with the binos, looking out, uh, looking about, and you're seeing movement or an animal. And it's what's that? There's something there. There's a brown thing. There's a grey thing. There's a. But you know, I think through that experience, I'm well. Generally, you can tell what everything is now. Mm -hmm. all, all the stuff we've been hunting all week, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a kudu. There's a. Well, pigs are obviously obvious, but you know, there's a impala, there's a mm. springbok. So, really pleased with that because it's just expanding my own knowledge. Um, but and you have an yeah. appreciation of what uh, you know, what, what's a, a big animal, what's a small animal, what's yeah, an yeah. old animal, what's a young animal, what's something definitely, you want to yeah, keep. especially with you know, looking at the uh, the horns and the condition of the animals as well. So, there yeah. were certain areas we've been where they've been quite poor, a few of them, some of the cull animals. So, yeah, it's been great, really good, really good. Um, can't wait to come back. So, now oh, Pete, I'm going to ambush you with the mic just for two <laughs> seconds. Two seconds. Uh, you don't do. Oh, you haven't done a lot of rifle hunting. I haven't done any. You hadn't done any before coming here. Have you? Has this trip been good for you in terms of an experience, like a, a new experience outside of? You've done a bit of shotgun shooting before, rifle shooting for the first time, and you've come to Africa. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, it's been a brilliant experience. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Something you'd uh, recommend to other people. Oh, definitely. If someone, if someone's, you don't even need to be into rifle shooting to come here and see it all. It's brilliant. Yeah. Just the the whole sort of experience and the people and and uh, getting out in different terrain. Yeah, hundred percent. That yeah. There's so many different types of terrain here as well. We were up in the mountains at one point and then around this place as well. It's it's, it's so much to see. Mm. Great. Thanks very much, gents. I'll leave you to your uh, beer. I think we've got twenty minutes before we're heading out again. So that is that. That's me introduce you to everybody that we are hunting here with this week. Uh, I've got still three weeks ahead of me, which is hard to believe. Uh, I'm just going to try and stand out of the wind here somewhere. I'm leaving here to go jump on a plane to go and see uh, my brother and I's uncle. 
and he was a crocodile hunter in years gone by. He's a fairly elderly gent now, so we wanted to go and catch up with him and just hear some of his old stories. So that's what I'm doing when we drop these guys off back at the airport. I'm jumping on a plane to Durban, go and spend a day or two with him, and then I'm going back up to Johannesburg, where I start the five or six day journey to learn all about the pangolins, which we've been telling you snippets of in the podcast over the last couple of months, because many of you will know that we've also been, or we have raised uh, a whole heap of money with the help of people giving items up for auction and those people who have been bidding on them. And I'm going to be taking all that equipment that we've bought to the people on the ground. So I'm going to the Pangolin Hospital, which is near Johannesburg, and then I'm driving all the way up to the northern border, where apparently we're going to be releasing some uh, rehabilitated pangolin and tracking some that they've been following for the last couple of weeks. And then after that, uh, it's a trip to Namibia uh, to meet a couple of different people, but I'm not going to tell you any more about that because I'm hopefully going to be bringing you a podcast from Namibia with the people that I'm, who I'm going to be seeing. Uh, so I think that's about that. I'm sure my brother, who is going to record the second half of this intro, has a couple of things that he needs to tell you about, so I will hand it over to him. And just like that, you are now in Scotland. Amazing. Now, I'll keep it very brief because uh, Barnes kind of explained everything that is uh, been happening, and I'm here for the competition. Now, we've had quite a number of people uh, tell us their thoughts on our previous podcast, which is Eduardo, and I thought that it would only be fair, since it's only been two weeks, that we actually let some more people listen, because we've had so many downloads on this latest podcast that uh there must be more people with with opinions. So we are going to actually run this competition for another two weeks, but never fear. We're going to start another competition as well. We're going to do another bundle like we did last time. So it'll be like a CZ doormat, there'll be a horny cap, there'll be definitely some CZ mints in there again, like we discussed before. And on this show, it is going to be it's going to be an Instagram an Instagram uh, competition. And all you have to do on Instagram is just tag us in a picture of what you're up to this springtime. So nice and easy. What what are you up to in spring? The sun is currently shining. It's been dull for the last two weeks or so in Scotland. Uh, I think that we're meant to have some good weather coming up very soon. So yeah, we, we just want to know what you're up to. Tag us in a picture on Instagram, uh, pace underscore brothers, and then you will be you'll be winning. Now, Byron mentioned earlier on that we have Max Lowe on, and in this this show we talk, it's kind of pinpoint what exactly we're talking about the whole time, but we, mainly a lot of it is film, filmmaking related, but it's all to do with Max and his life, starting from youngster all the way through to adult, and his filmmaking and photography career that he started with National Geographic basically in 2000. 12. I think I think that's right if I remember correctly. It was a really fun podcast to edit and it was great having Max on and he's involved in so many amazing projects and you should definitely go check out his Instagram page. He's very active on Instagram and uh, if you want to see some more of his stuff then you can go to his website which is maxlowmedia.com. I also have some other exciting news. We, well, not we, a client of ours that we look after, we look after the the Gallic uh, whiskey and gin, uh, we do a lot of their film and photography for them, and they have just started a treasure hunt. Now, this is a very, very, very cool treasure hunt in the fact that you can win a bottle of whiskey. Now, it's starting, uh, well, in fact, it has started. As I speak the, this, this podcast, uh, the second clue has gone out. And uh, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grab my phone and I'm going to read you the second clue because I'm nice like that. Let's have a look. Now, the second clue is an illicit still was found in this village thought to have come from the late 18th to early 19th century. Now it can be found in a museum on a road following the North Esk. Only a 15-minute drive from Loch Lee, the whiskey you seek lies close to the museum. Now, if you live locally in the northeast, 
or around this area, you will know exactly where that is. I like to think you would. There is one more clue, and it will point you almost bang on where you need to find it. So this is a, good, a really fun treasure hunt, and there'll be clues every month, and there'll be different locations around Scotland, from the east all the way to the west. And uh, yeah, so just follow Gallic Whiskey Gin on Instagram or on Facebook, and then you get updated. And if you are live in Scotland or you're coming to Scotland, there'll be there'll be a treasure hunt throughout the entire year. So get involved. It's it's well worth it. If you're a whiskey drinker, it's well worth it. Even if you're not a whiskey drinker, just just get involved. I'm tr- I was just trying to think if there was any other news. Oh, Northern Shooting Show. That is that is imminently upon us. It is the, I'm just having a look at the calendar right now, it is the 11th, 12th of May. We're very excited to be going, we're going to have a few new products and if you have been waiting on coffee actually, we've just got a new load of coffee in, it's it's not currently on the website but hopefully it will be in the next day or so. We also have whole beans, yes we, we have listened to people and we have now got whole beans and ground in both of our coffees so hopefully we can cater to everyone's needs well there's nothing left to say but enjoy the show max welcome to the into the wilderness podcast thanks guys i'm going to start with uh, saying we had an awesome time in yellowstone with you the other day it blew us away yeah that's pretty cool huh i mean you live here i know you hadn't been for a little while but it must still be magical even though you go there loads or have been there loads yeah it's funny living next to a place like that i mean i think it's like like anyone who lives anywhere cool I mean, I wish I could get over to Scotland and see the Hebrides. Hmm. I don't know how you how often you guys get up into the wild parts of Scotland to look at cool stuff, but <laughs> we out. try, we try. But you're right; you often take for granted what you have on your doorstep. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to remind yourself of that uh, it's it's not quite nearly as difficult to get out and do cool stuff as everyone thinks, thinks. it is. Yeah, you don't need to travel to the far reaches of the world to have cool experiences <laughs> usually. When was the last time you were in? Uh, we, we should have said actually, Tyler's joining us on the podcast today okay. as a as a third member of the Into the Wilderness team. Yeah, interviewing. So I'm Max. the safety net when the trapeze <laughs> act fails in a wilderness. Yeah, you hadn't been into. When was the last time you were in Yellowstone, Tyler? I was there in December. Okay, so it wasn't that long. Actually. My dad and some friends of mine came in town, and that was. My dad had been in before, but his girlfriend had not, and then my best friend from Texas had never been. So. We took them in, and it was an even more eventful day than than our day on Saturday, Thanks. where we, well, just you know, I mean, the sheep were there, and the wildlife played ball. Yes, we but didn't it, we didn't have the freak gasoline it minus fight, twenty though. elk battle, but yeah, so you know, relatively, relatively soon. So you're basically a Yellowstone tour guide. It's kind of an obligation. I think Max would probably concur there. When people come in town, they're like, "Take me into the park." Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's one of those places that draws people in from all over the world. So if you Rightly so. If you haven't been there and you don't know what it's like, it's definitely cool. Max is taking inquiries time, for tour guides. <laughs> <laughs> Sideline yeah. business. Definitely. I think wintertime is probably my favorite time to go just because there's nobody there. It's we were saying that in our very short little news type podcast we did with Tyler yesterday was it was there was a few cars about, but it was kind of like we had the park to ourselves, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, it's it's a madhouse in the summertime. I mean, Bozeman is uh, it's definitely kind of a spot where a lot of people come through on their way to Glacier, Yellowstone, doing the park tour and in the Northwest. And uh, yeah, it's cool to see all the people going and experiencing that sort of stuff. But yeah, kind of prefer to keep it <laughs> keep it quiet for myself when I go over there to experience it. I was trying to decide where to start this podcast, having a chance to chat with you a bit in the car yesterday when I when I abandoned my uh, my host <laughs> Tyler for better company absolutely um and my brother I thought you just wanted to hang out yeah it's all they were boring a- me in that car <laughs> <laughs> um I was so I've been trying to decide where to start this and it's I wasn't sure if to start at the end and work back and sort of show people in but I, I think we're gonna have to start this kind of at the start in terms of your early life I mean you Travel around the world doing very cool shit, but it came from, it's hard, almost hardly surprising that that's what you do. Well, that's how it seems to me when you had the sort of upbringing that you had. So enlighten us a little bit to that, sure. to our, our listeners. 
Uh, well, um, just a little background. My stepdad is Connor Danker, who's a professional mountaineer. Uh, he was in a film that was widely released called Meru. Awesome film. Uh, that detailed our family's story in some regard, um, but mostly his climbing history. Uh, and my biological father was Alex Lowe, who was Conrad's best friend. Um, he passed away in an avalanche in 1999 and, um, Conrad was there in the avalanche with him, survived and, uh, eventually came back and kind of through this process of grieving the loss of, uh, our father and my mom's husband and Conrad's best friend came together and, um, Eventually, Conrad married my mom and adopted me and my brother's kind of stepping in for Alex uh, in his stead. And um, yeah, it's been a it's been a wild life for sure. I mean, before before that event. Um, so how old were you at that at that point in time when your dad died? I was 11 years old when Alex uh, passed away in the avalanche in Tibet. And um, I have two younger brothers. Uh one of whom was seven and the other of whom was two. And yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a life changing experience for sure in a lot of ways. But I mean, our lives up until that point had definitely been, you know, what you might expect looking at our story in retrospect. Um, Alex and my mom kind of came together over climbing. They traveled the world together climbing and that's kind of how they fell in love and built this infrastructure for their life that they would go on to build for themselves and uh, bring us into and I mean Alex was just getting into high altitude mountaineering uh, when I was born uh, he became the 50 some uh, 52nd 53rd uh, American to climb Everest uh, when I was two years old and we went over and met him in Thailand after he completed that ascent and <clears throat> kind of throughout our lives. I mean, we were just following in Alex's footsteps as far as wherever he was going for work. So, so you, you got to go to some and, awesome places following him. Yeah. I mean, we would follow him in the summer times down to the Tetons. We lived in the Tetons for four summers uh, when he was working for Exum mountain guides down there. Um, just like, just to clarify, Most. that's in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Yeah, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Yeah, uh, Teton National Park. Uh, so Alex is guiding the Tetons, and our family um, lived down at the base of the Tetons. So it was like the most awesome Huck Finn kid <laughs> experience you could ever imagine. <laughs> yeah. Just like living in a national park and building forts and romping around and learning how to fish on Jenny Lake and in the little creeks and rivers. And, um, just spending all of our time outside. We lived in like a one room cabin for two and a half months every summer, our whole family. So you were just outside all day, every day, properly free. Yeah. So that was awesome. And a huge, um, I think f founding part of why I value the outdoors is just learning so much from my parents about it, um, through Alex and my mom, uh, but then continuing, um, with Conrad when he stepped into our lives, uh, and, and Conrad and Alex were kind of equals in, in a sense. And uh, he uh, led very much a similar life to the one that Alex led. So when he became our dad and adopted uh, me and my two brothers, um, we continued going on these adventures outdoors and traveling all over the world, which is cool. Yeah, I've seen uh, some of the, as part of my research for this podcast, I saw, <laughs> I've seen a few pictures of you as a, as a youngster mm -hmm. in just yeah. epic locations. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> enviably epic locations. Yeah, uh, places that most people, if they ever have a chance to go there, is sort of at the end of, or middle to end of their lives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, before high school, um, with our family, we had traveled to across Europe. Uh, we'd been to Antarctica twice, um, Mongolia, um, Chile, Argentina. Uh, I think my youngest brother Isaac had traveled to more countries than uh Bush Jr. had traveled to when he was elected president. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great litmus test there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so 
yeah, it, uh, it was a priority that uh, my parents um, put down. And I mean, I think it, even myself, like looking at raising a family one day, you know, now I'm 30 years old. So that's something that you have on your mind growing up. It's like, it's a lot of work to take your kids along on crazy adventures all over the world. <laughs> were you homeschooled at all then if you were moving so much or were they, was, no. it, was it moving around the school year? Kind of we would, we would be pulled out of school yeah, uh, yeah. occasionally, yeah. but we weren't traveling that much. Yeah. I mean, we were usually at home, um, but we would get taken out of school for a couple of weeks if we were going on like a big trip and just make it up along the way. Yeah. It hasn't hurt you. No, I don't think. <laughs> you know, I wasn't ever school. really the best <laughs> student, but I managed to graduate college. And so what did you study at college? Today. Given that background, what was it that interested you going through high school and, and into college? What did you think you wanted to do? It normally changes for most of us. Yeah. Reality. I, mean, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in high school. Like most high school students, I guess. I was mostly just focused on trying to fit in and... Um, Chase girls, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. I didn't really get get into chasing girls until uh, later in life. I was a bit of a nerd. Played a lot of video games, actually, which I probably maybe shouldn't admit in public. But uh, it's too late, unless that's a challenge to other gamers. <laughs> yeah, I lived like these dual lives in high school. I kind of, I was like in the school newspaper and I was the editor in chief of that my senior year. And then I like skied and had all my outdoor cool friends. And then I had my friends that I would like play video games and build like model Warhammers with. <laughs> That's just like Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> you, were, you were fishing, you were fly fishing a lot too, right? Oh yeah. And fishing and doing everything else outdoors that, um, I had grown up doing. Uh, but it was, yeah. High school is weird for everyone. I think. <laughs> um, but I went to, uh, I graduating high school, I, I had been in journalism and in high school and, um, done the newspaper and my mom had given me my first camera, um, uh, early on, like my last year of middle school going into high school and kind of stepped into photography and taking darker in photography in high school and kind of saw journalism and storytelling and photography as this venue by which I could take these things that I knew and loved already being in the outdoors and um, some of these opportunities that I was given through my family and access to meeting cool people and going to interesting places and kind of make them more my own. Um, you know, I think a lot of people separate their lives from when they're children and, you know, when they're grown up. Um, but for me, I mean, growing up in the shadow of Alex Lowe, who was this amazing, famous mountaineer. I mean, to me, it was just my dad, but he was still my hero in a lot of different ways. And seeing him go off to these far flung places and then seeing Conrad do the same. <clears throat> I mean, it was something that intrigued me and something that I, you know, I, at that point I definitely had no confidence in the fact that I would ever be able to make it a life for myself or a job, much less. Um, but it was definitely something that I was like, wow, that would be cool if I could travel and, and do, do things, some of that, do things like my dad has done, <laughs> like make a life for myself, uh, in, in some way. Um, but I went to school at, at uh, Westminster college in Salt Lake city and, uh, ended up studying international business and Spanish. Um, how's your Spanish now? <laughs> uh, <Multibuena>. <laughs> <laughs> So so, <laughs> hablo un poquito de español, um, but uh, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> that, that was one beer down. You are not excused. Um, yeah, I never really thought that I would be able to make photography and story. So what was the crossover? Career, so I didn't point. study it. <laughs> so yeah, so you went and did that. I thought business would be a much more prudent way to find a job when I actually grew up someday. That was your sensible head on. Yeah. Yeah, that but, wasn't uh, the little kid inside you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I ended up studying business, but continued shooting still photography through college and working for some small publications. And um, yeah, when I graduated, I looked at getting a real job and interviewed for a couple of real jobs. And 
You mean like I'm in an office nine to five type jobs? Yeah. Well, I interviewed for GoPro actually, and um, would have that been in its sort of early days? Yeah, that was in GoPro's early days, and I would should have, have come bought some on shares. As, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, seriously. But uh, yeah, I I just didn't really want to. Did you get the Step job? up and I don't I don't know. They were like, "Well, can you move to the Bay Area in two weeks?" And it was like the fall after I graduated school, and I was like, "Oh man, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to go full time into something like this and give up trying to maybe do something for myself and yeah. having a little bit more freedom." For geographical life. reference, that's San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's I'm, glad, I'm glad we've got our active map here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I uh, I turned that job down and. And I uh, decided to just work as a waiter instead for the winter and live in Bozeman and ski a bunch and which continue is where taking pictures. Bozeman, where we are now. Which is where we are now. In your very cool little office outside the house. Yeah. yeah. I like this place. It's yeah. nice. It has a yeah, good it's nice. feel to it. Snow and the skylights. It's nice and chilly outside, full on winter. So what was, what was the crossover point? Because I'm just picturing you here, knowing what I know about you now, as waiter. a waiter <laughs> <laughs> who owns a camera <laughs> who's evidently waiting tables and then just skiing <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's the ski bum dream man <laughs> you uh you work at a restaurant and then you get to eat the f- free food at the restaurant <laughs> and then you ski during the day so what you're saying is tip your waiter and leave food <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the plate <laughs> don't finish your steak <laughs> um yeah i worked for a winter and I made plans to go travel with some friends the following spring um, in India for a couple months. And uh, that winter, I went to this seminar here in Bozeman um, that was put on by National Geographic, um, promoting their Young Explorers grant program, um, which has now changed to uh, something called the uh, Emerging Careers Grant, I believe. But uh, basically, it was it was a small grant opportunity uh, for anyone under the age of 26 who had a story idea or a science idea or some sort of social social science idea to um, you know put that thing to paper and try and you know bring you out of that phase of life where you're just fantasizing about this thing that you're really passionate about and make it more of a reality. And I went to that and it was awesome and I ended up talking to the folks who were there running it from National Geographic. Um, my stepdad, Conrad, was uh, heading up expedition with Nat Geo that spring in Nepal. So they were also here meeting uh, with him. And, um, yeah, pitched them this idea to go over to Nepal. Uh, I'd been there once before with my family um, and do a story on how uh, adventure tourism had changed the cultural and social geography of, of the Kumbu region, which is where Everest is. And, um, yeah, developed this project and sent in the pitch um, and went off to India, never really assuming that I would get it or um, anything would come of it and ended up getting an email from them. And While you were in India? Receiving this grant while I was in India. And, um, yeah. It was it's not it a was bad way to moment. start. <laughs> I was like in this like shitty internet cafe next to um, the Taj Mahal in Agra, and I was like, "Holy hell, yes!" I just get hired by National Geographic. <laughs> yeah. National Geographic, holy cow! Um, For, so that was the first major win in the world of photography and storytelling. It was really a job for the most well-known publication yeah. for that in the world. Now, in your talk that I did watch earlier. Your first paid gig was a pizza voucher. Yes. He's yeah. omitted that from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my first paid gig was in pizza vouchers in Salt Lake City <laughs> uh, for a, a little publication I was working for there. But yeah, that it, it was a uh, it wasn't like a huge amount of money, and I wasn't even getting paid. Uh, it was enough money to cover my trip expenses, and that was about it. Um, but more than anything else, it was just like the confidence that you can do that and I think that's the biggest hurdle when it comes down to doing anything as a freelancer or for yourself as an entrepreneur or whatever you might be doing 
on your own if you're if you're not stepping into a pre-existing infrastructure for work if you're trying to spearhead something on your own like the biggest challenge is believing that you can do it and like just and being brave stepping enough. out on that edge yeah. and being like all right yeah I'll put my money where my mouth is and try and do this thing and sometimes without really a rounded plan yeah no <laughs> yeah well, more I'd often than not maybe a good majority of the things that i've done over the years have just started as an idea and plan has developed as you as you facilitate <laughs> whatever you might be doing and what was that project like because it's quite an interesting uh it's quite an interesting aspect of the society and culture there that you were looking at because i would imagine it has having visited there but only once a year and a half ago i can imagine it has changed vastly mm-hmm. yeah. in a very short space of time relatively speaking yeah i mean there's a lot of good examples of of it across the world but um just the way that the world is changing and um the way that the the globalized world is interacting with these places like you know now nowadays we're hearing about the amazon uh like the brazilian amazon these un- previously uncontacted tribes like running into loggers and stuff like that you know uh and not to say that the kumba wasn't ever um previously influenced by the outside world but after everest was conquered quote unquote and became somewhat of a global uh, draw for people who were looking to go over and test their grit and climb. And, um, you know, it, it's grown over the last 40 years, this industry of climbing that has centered largely around Everest and Nepal and trekking. People want to go over there and look at it. And so from about, you know, 19, the late 1950s into the 1970s, um, this area that had been large, largely uh, subsistence farming and, just yak herders and people who had come over from Tibet were living in the high mountains, um, largely cut off from the outside world, became one of the most uh, globalized regions in the whole country and one of the richest regions in the country because of that. So people went from being yak herders and shop owners to you know, this one woman that I tracked down who I had a so I had all these old photographs from the sixties who a photographer friend of mine, Gordon Wiltsey had provided. And, um, uh, this one wom- woman who in the old image was this young girl working at her parents' shop had grown up and left and studied dentistry in uh, Canada and got her doctorate and then moved back and opened like the first dentist clinic wow. in the Kumbu. Um, you know, wow. so going that like that much change in one one generation was that's crazy was a lot yeah for that region so just looking at that and talking about the influences on culture and what people's priorities are and where where was the output of that project eventually um that was published in part in a book that national geographic did called everest the 50th i think um probably have a copy of it or something actually but um yeah it it went into a book um that they did about everest as well as a handful of online stories that i wrote and shot some images for with national geographic adventure and you must have come back from that pretty pumped about actually delivering something to someone like national geographic but what was the what was the what was the next thing because ultimately you still got to feed yourself (laughs) well i mean um I, I finished up my grant work over there and um, I was headed home actually. And uh, Corey Richards was the lead photographer on my dad's expedition about Everest. And um, he had his assistant with them uh, there, Andy Barden. And Corey had to leave the trip because uh, of some health complications, um, kind of like late in the game. And they called me up. I was about to head home and asked me if I would come back up and assist on this Nat Geo magazine story wow. after I had finished my grant so it was like bam boom like <laughs> baptism of fire <laughs> yeah yeah it was sure it was nuts my schedule's so. pretty open <laughs> yeah i was just gonna go home and go to sasquatch the music festival. <laughs> <laughs> probably go back to working as a waiter all which, summer which is a music festival in the gorge <laughs> in washington state <laughs> thank you mr shop yep um 
so yeah, I, w- I ended up back up at Everspace Camp working uh, as an assistant photographer on the this magazine story for another four weeks. And how high so did that you go? Blew my mind. Were, were you following Again. the expedition? Uh, I was just at base camp. Okay. Yeah. So I was there just mostly managing project and helping the the lead photographer who was then Andy do his work. I assume uh, you must have done to that point quite a bit of climbing yourself. Uh, not, not I really? mean, a, a decent amount. I mean, I had traveled a lot with our family and yeah. we hadn't, I hadn't climbed any, I, I climbed Kilimanjaro. That was probably the highest peak that I had climbed up into that point. And we'd trekked in Nepal before I hadn't done any technical mountaineering at that point, but, um, I'd been at altitude a lot. So it can be a killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, uh, definitely. tough. First uh, I've you can't, Try to really explain it to somebody unless you experience. I don't think, and I wasn't even yeah. that high, but I did really did feel like shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will get you if you're not careful. You gotta manage yourself. But uh, yeah, I was up there for four weeks, and then I then I came home and got a job as a barista, <laughs> close <laughs> making lattes. Um, yeah, but the kind art, of under the, the guise is probably really good. Your <laughs> yeah. latte art. Uh, my latte art was all right. So that was that a step up from the waiter that you were before? Was it like a more high class uh, joint? I don't know. I was a daytime barista, whereas like the night waiter, you get more tips usually. Uh, so okay. probably a step down, sadly. Oh. So this is a career progression dip now. Okay, I'm glad that we're mapping <laughs> this well. But it was a part time gig that I didn't hold on to for all that long because, um, my buddy Andy Barden, who had shot that story for Nat Geo and spend a bunch of time with him he uh he kind of came to me and was just like yeah dude like if you want to be a photographer you should just be a photographer just stop making coffee <laughs> just, <laughs> just quit do your it. job and try and make it work just do it <laughs> and uh it's harder said than done for sure um i was definitely still living at my parents house um to make ends meet but uh yeah, I, I quit my job and just kind of started taking on little gigs here and there. Um, some local publications here in Montana that led to some video work with some local businesses and um, eventually uh, ended up doing some work for National Geographic Adventure. Um, did this series of short videos and blogs um, that I produced and shot with some friends here in Montana. And... Uh, what was that on? That was called uh, Montana by Dirt. And so we had traversed the state from south to north border by majority dirt roads, um, starting down in uh, Cook City um, in the north northeast part of Yellowstone and then going up and over the Beartooth Plateau and then kind of snaking our way up to Glacier National Park. So... Um, yeah, that was that was probably my like next big job, um, and that kind of turned into a, a bunch of these series of videos and photo stories that I did for National Geographic Adventure over the next few years that were then interspersed with other different stuff. And um, how did you make well, the switch over yeah. from <coughs> stills to stills to video? Was it something you consciously did, or you got asked to do it and just like? Shit, I'll just make it happen and work it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I had shot a couple, like, little things um, just on my, my Nikon D750 or not even, probably D, like, D400, 350. <laughs> I don't even I think D700 what it, was what the first was. one that shot yeah. good video. Yeah, it was the D700. Yeah, it was, like, the first Nikon DSLR that shot video, basically. Yeah. And, um I just been messing around with it and uh, this job opportunity came up and they're like, well, this is how much money we have and this is what we want. And I was like, great. I'll do it all. I'll, 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 do, it. I'll do it all. <laughs> so yeah, I, I uh, wrangled one of my buddies who I had learned a lot of photography stuff from in high school here in town, uh, my buddy Graham. Um, and I uh, got my friend Brody Levin, who's an athlete on board to come along as kind of the talent and, just kind of strung together this project and um you know looking back on it it's definitely like not i wasn't a prodigy right off the bat (laughs) like compared (laughs) to the stuff i'm doing now it's like 
kind of uh, shameful that it's even out there on the internet. Is it still there to see? Oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm gonna look it up it. when we go back. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. It was super fun, uh, just like a trip with my friends where we got to tell a story about it. And um, yeah, I think you, that's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. You, even if you're not sure you can. Yeah, you just I mean, gotta forge on. Even if you you don't have all the skills to be able to facilitate something. I think you just got to do it and learn along the way. And they were obviously happy enough with the output. Yeah, they were psyched on it, surprisingly, enough to facilitate me doing probably like four or five more of these series of web episodes and blogs sponsored by different brands. No, we've, uh, I was having a look through your... The first thing I watched last night was your showreel. Hmm. And there's some... I mean, there's some truly epic footage in there. Working back now from what you're, uh, you've just been working on recently. What's the, what's your sort of flagship film and project that uh, that is done and dusted that people could go and look? I mean, a- any one of the sort of eight that are in there were all awesome that I, I saw on 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 your sort of web page and showreel. But yeah, what's the one that kind of stands out most recently for you? Um, probably Adventure Not War. Yeah, you were watching yeah. that this morning. Oh, that's, I was, that's the one I was talking about before we came on the, the podcast, and that was the one that stood out for yeah. me. Yeah, and I had done a bunch of other like short little video pieces. Thank you. Fresh beer. <laughs> um, I had done a lot of other short little storytelling pieces before that, but Adventure Not War was kind of the first one where I stepped out of like the this trip that I'm on with these people kind of incorporating myself and the journey that we were on together uh, as part of the story and um, focusing more on like a character profile and like shooting it more classic verite documentary style. Um, Where did the concept for that come? Sorry, you were just about to answer my question. (laughs) I just wanted to know where it came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So that, that film started with a conversation with, friend of mine stacy bear who's the main character um see the the funny guy (laughs) yeah he's hilarious yeah Yeah, he's pretty funny guy (laughs) but uh yeah we were just at outdoor retailer together and having a beer after well i was having a beer he's sober uh so he was drinking something else maybe but uh yeah um talking about this idea that he had that he wanted to go back and um, revisit some of these places he was just deployed as a soldier and um, after we, he was in the military doing uh, landmine clearance work and uh, go back and kind of re-engage with these places that he saw uh, from this kind of protected perspective of working with an outside force and being cut off from the local community and the world that they exist in and through that experience kind of exploring these these experiences that he had in these places that were uh in many in many cases you know traumatic and scary and negative uh, that impacted his life in uh, some pretty powerful ways and yeah so he he was just like why well, I, I mean this is this is what i'm thinking and you know you, you want to go make a movie with me in iraq go skiing i was like um Sure. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe there's a ski center there. <laughs> yeah. One ski hill in Iraq. Not yeah, it's just barely a ski center. Yeah. Ski center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a new one. It it had a chairlift. <laughs> it had a lift. And I had a slope. That's could, a ski center. That's all we have. I was Scotland. about to say you gotta remember our bar is set pretty, pretty low. low. <laughs> I'm spilling beer. I'm now comparing the Scottish ski centres with Iraq. (laughs) But yes, (laughs) nah, they're not that bad. (laughs) Sounds like the YMCA. Look at the ski centre. Yeah. (laughs) Um, We don't have much more than that. (laughs) He wasn't even lying. Watch out for the ordnance. Yeah. God. Um, That must have been an an incredible journey for you to follow him back there and and the rest of the team you were with. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean the journey and the whole process of making the film and then the film itself were all a huge step for me um, as far as my storytelling goes. And I think it really shifted my perspective and priority as far as storytelling goes too. I mean, up until that point, 
I was just kind of riding this wave of, you know, short adventure films that had become kind of a staple in the outdoor industry and um, took it more into a realm of, you know, there's real stories out there that accompany some pretty powerful human experiences and sharing those um, via adventure and taking these things that I know, like skiing and being in the outdoors or... Um, uh, things that I love personally and mixing those with stories from from other people's perspective, more personal elements of their lives. Um, yeah, I think looking to have some sort of impact beyond just showing people that you're out there having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> and making <laughs> stories about it. And making when people think about their lives a little bit more maybe. How long how long ago was that released? Uh, so we, let's see here. We shot that in 2016 and we released it, um, for a short period of time for Veterans Day that same year. Uh, we released a short version for North Face. They were the title sponsor, um, in June or May or June. Uh, and then we pulled the longer film, which is about 27 minutes and, um, ended up submitting it to a handful of different festivals. Um, it premiered at Tribeca, New York, and uh, then continued on to screen at Five Point Film Festival and uh, Mountain Film and Telluride. A Brilliant. Hand, a handful of other film festivals. It, it was featured in the Cannes um, short film library. That's amazing. Well, Good cool. effort. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so it really, I mean, it was this project that, Stacy and I kind of bootstrapped into existence um, with the help of a production company that I work with called Stepped. And um, yeah, took a lot of belief. There was a lot of people that I, bet I was just thought about to it say. was pretty far fetched. <laughs> and, you know, there's been a lot of stories around veterans and PTSD, but this was a whole different journey. It was and, very different. Um, and story to tell, which was pretty cool to be a part of. So, And it's nice to get the after putting so much into a project like that not just from you but also from the the people who are in it um to get the the elements of recognition as it's going around the sort of film festival circuit and yeah being part of the selections for different film festivals yeah yeah it was really cool it was i mean the most powerful moment for me was probably sitting in a you know giant auditorium of of uh people and watching this film unfold with the experiences of these, these three veterans, Robin, Stacy and Griff and um, sitting there with them and then walking up on stage and having everyone stand like a standing ovation for them. It Incredible. was just like, it, it made it so much more worth it. Yeah. When you tell someone's experience and they're vulnerable and you give them that opportunity by this process it's one of the coolest things ever as a storyteller. Um, yeah, definitely how, what I want to do more of. <laughs> how did you, because we kind of, uh, by skipping to the end from your to your last project or your latest one that's been released, you've done a lot of directing in between flicking the video switch over on your SLR to do the, the stuff for National Geographic. How did how did that transformation take place? Because I know that in the early days when you're, well, I suppose for most people who get involved in film, you're kind of everything. You're the sound guy, mm -hmm. you're the director, you're the cinematographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, and I still to this day, sometimes do jobs where I do everything. But uh, yeah, for probably like the first three, four years of my career, that was pretty much all I was doing. I mean, I was like shooting, producing and directing everything that I did yeah, with help usually from at least someone else who was there. But um, yeah, in the last couple of years I've transitioned a little bit more into just directing. I um, started working with Stepped two years ago, um, the fall prior to uh, working on Adventure Not War. We went and uh, shot this little short film called Slacker um, down in Utah about the slacklining festival and this old climber guy who had uh, started the festival and uh, 
yeah, uh, that was, uh, that was the first job that we did together and it was definitely, um, awesome partnership and, um, I'm signed with them currently as a, as a director. So that was kind of my first foray into just directing and not having a camera in hand. Did it feel strange? It felt a little strange. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I, I still, it's hard for me to not shoot because I just love doing everything, but it's also pretty nice to have a team of competent people who will only bolster your make you look good good. how good you look yeah i suppose part of it's pulling a good team together oh yeah yeah that's that that is the only part of it really i mean your project is only as good as the people around you where did um the film you did with charles fit into your sort of timeline sky migrations we I love that. I watched that long time before I knew anything about you. This was maybe a, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, I watched that and I loved it. Yeah. Probably as a result Thanks. of Charles about to come onto the podcast. That would be why I was watching it. But We shot that... Um, God, I don't even remember. It's been a while now. I think it was fall of 2015. No. Fall of 2016. Um we shot that fall of 2016 and we're kind of working on it for a long time. We didn't have any funding. Uh, it was just Forrest, myself and Charles. Charles um, wrangled us all into this <laughs> road trip. <laughs> Come for a trip, guys. Bring your camera gear. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we had like a couple hundred bucks or something like that to buy snacks and fresh pressed juices that Charles demands. <laughs> <laughs> Would you call him Spa Master Charles? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we just kind of all threw our threw our effort in the pot and went and did this road trip. And at the end of it, we we didn't even really know if we had a film or not because we had set out to make a film about the raptor migration and uh, the folks at Hawk Watch. Um, and we we had only visited two of their sites and spent a handful of days with them, but. Um, and looking at bringing the the film to life, and uh, we ended up going to OR and cutting together a little teaser and um, getting some funding from Mountain Hardware um, to kind of cut this thing together. And um, yeah, it uh, it came into perspective that it, it was less of a story just about these scientists and more a story about. Um, the experience that we had on this journey to follow the birds and engage in science in more of a fun way. Um, I think there's been a lot of documentaries about science done over the years and oftentimes they're sad and a little dry. (laughs) Um, But, you know, Charles is just so excited about, about birds and I thought you were going to say everything. <laughs> Every, and, and whenever everything. I speak to him, it's pretty enthusiastic. <laughs> Anything to do with wildlife and the outdoors, Charles is on. The- whenever I have a bad day, I just call Charles. And yeah. He's a burst of energy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, having him kind of as our lead character to interpret this world that he knows so well as an ecologist um, in such an exuberant way really made the whole experience, I think. And I, I, I think, you know, it's been um that technique has been used in some other ways i mean you look at other major documentary films like chasing coral you know i I really enjoyed that as well the characters are what make the film the content is the foundation but what brings it to life are the people who are there invested in this stuff that are emotional about it because it's their lives and it's exciting when something happens that you have been waiting to see happen for forever. (laughs) And it's sad when something you love is dying or disappearing. And, uh, um, I think connecting through a character in those sort of situations is really the best way to go about telling those sorts of stories. It makes it more, it almost makes it more meaning, meaningful for the watch. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. A sort of deeper connection. It would be easy for me to forget uh, to ask you about your recent trip to North Pole and Antarctica (laughs) before I got to the Mm -hmm. next thing, which had nearly slipped my mind, but not that many people get to do both or either. uh, Tell us about about those two trips. Yeah, well, um, 
the Antarctica trip was, um, I was down there working with National Geographic expeditions as a photographer and guest photographer, teacher and speaker. Um, so I wasn't really there working on a film per se, but, um, it was really awesome just going to getting to go back down there. Um, I've been there several times with my family and then worked on a trip uh, as a photographer, photo teacher on another charter a handful of years ago, but it's just a good reminder that it's a f- special place down there. And um, So you'd even, rec- even the most remote wilderness is being impacted. You'd, uh, you'd recommend the people to, the if they had the chance, go the there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you can manage to get down to Antarctica, I'd highly recommend it. And you don't need... It helps if you're rich, but you don't necessarily need to be rich to get there. Um, there's lots of jobs on ships, and um, I've had several friends who have volunteered and uh, gone down and worked at McMurdo Station uh, under government contracts. So there are ways to get down there, uh, even if you're not um, rolling in dough or have a bunch of excess money that you've been saving for 35 years <laughs> yeah, to yeah. spend on a ship charter, but... Um, have you seen it change? I mean, it, it, it's like it's it's kind of a, it's hard when you're not a scientist to be yeah. like this has changed. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed. I mean, we were there in December, um, which is you know it's Antarctic summer, but there was substantially less snow and ice around uh, than when I had been there when I was a kid. I mean. I specifically remember a lot of these places that we went when I was younger being substantially snower, snowier and, um, you know, there's just less ice in the water because the glaciers are smaller and receding and, um, you know, it's all speculative because, you know, without having the data tables in front of you and seeing yeah, every, of course. everything laid out in a scientific way, it's It's still to interesting to know not, but visually, visually yeah. how people... you. you yeah. Generally, yeah. You, you have a fairly good feeling if you know something, if a place has changed a lot over a, oh, yeah. a period of time, like through a life, through your own lifetime. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's hard to say what exactly is impacting the change, but, you know, there's places that we were at where there was 500,000 pairs of mating penguins before. And this last time when we were down there, there was only, you know, 10,000, 15,000 penguins. Um, so yeah, things are changing constantly, but, you know, I think that we might have a little bit more impact than maybe we think or see. And that's, you, that's very connected to what you were doing in the North Pole. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so the North Pole project was much more of a directed, uh, story that I had worked on and formulated, um, kind of in partnership with this nonprofit based here in Bozeman called Polar Bears International that works to um, kind of get the message out about what's going on with polar bears in the Arctic uh, and kind of act as the PR company for polar bears in, uh, in their plight um, with climate change and um, the changes in the sea ice up there that really affects the polar bears. It's what affects their their livelihood Uh, i mean when people talk about the polar bears dying from climate change it's because they can't go out on the ice to hunt seals until much later in the winter and they're getting bumped off the ice much sooner in the spring because the winters are shorter and the ice is forming substantially later in the season and then thawing out earlier on in the spring and the bears are starving to death because they are huge animals that live in the middle of the Arctic <laughs> tundra. And the only thing they can eat to sustain themselves really is seals. Um, and uh, yeah, so we went up and made this short film about some of the folks who work for PBI. Um, several of the uh, people who work, work there in uh, Churchill with PBI are um, polar bear researchers, biologists who have spent, um, many, many years studying the bears. Um, their lead scientist, Steve Armstrong, is one of the one of the kind of founding guys when it comes to polar bear um, science in correlation with climate change uh, and studies. Um, 
he started his career uh, in Alaska studying the bears and um, actually was one of the huge uh, proponents uh, actually testified in Congress uh, to get polar bears list as, as endangered species. And uh, yeah, he, at a certain point he, you know, he came to the conclusion that the science was in, I mean, they had done as much science as they could to, Prove. prove the point that polar bears are threatened by climate change. Like, it's doing science only works to a certain point. You need to be able to get that message out to the public. I mean, you can collect all the data you want, but if it just sits in a journal... you got to action it. Yeah, it's got to it's gotta get out into the world, and people need to be able to hear that message. So uh, he took up with PBI pretty early on and um, they've been working for many years now um, doing this work so we went up there and followed Steve and um, this young woman Alyssa McCall and a handful of these other uh, folks with PBI who are, are uh, working to kind of spread the message about polar bears and um, climate change and you know so go, they... go a little bit deeper into that whole story that a lot of people have heard on a very surface level do they have a handle on how much the population has declined over a period of time? Yeah, and I don't want to uh, be spreading false information, but um, I think it's the, the it's forecasted that if if things continue uh, as they as they are, we'll we'll lose a third of the polar bear population in the next fifty years, um, and then exponentially on from there could you see uh, as the as the person behind the the film that you were there to make could you see uh an impact was it was it very visual and, and quite obvious in terms of like the, i'm thinking from what you've you've explained it's the condition of the bears i mean essentially they're they're starving or certainly the young the young bears will not be able to see a winter if they can't get enough food in them early on yeah yeah i mean again it's like science is it's such a, it's a tough thing. You can't like take one experience and be like, this of course. is climate change. Well, you can, action. if you're trying to distort something, use you one can. experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it, and it, it serves a point and gets a message out, but it also, you know, it upsets other scientists, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, we showed up there, um, beginning of November. I think we got in November 2nd into Churchill and the sea was still completely open with the Hudson Bay. And uh, all the bears are just there waiting for the ice. Um, they've been fasting all summer since like April, May and uh, haven't eaten very much. So they're super hungry and a lot of them are super skinny. And, um, you know, compared to 80 years ago, 120 years ago, the ice was forming in September. So it's a long time to just hang out in the cold, even if you are a giant polar bear. So, um, yeah, we saw a lot of thin bears and we, uh, even witnessed a predation of a cub. Um, this mother who was kind of thin and weak looking and we didn't actually see the cub get caught and killed, but, uh, rolled up on this scene of two male bears eating this baby polar bear, which was pretty traumatic and dramatic. Um, but yeah, I mean, not, not to say like that's because of climate change, but I mean, that, that would happen. That is the potential yeah. outcome of bears starving. Yeah. yeah. The, there's no option but to eat like, each other. Yeah. I mean, I, it kind of speaks to, but we're all going to end up facing <laughs> with climate change, you know. We're all going to be running out of food and water and bickering over what's left over. And Yeah, I, the point of the, the whole film project was to kind of use polar bears in this story, uh, uh, and the situation that they're facing, and put a mirror um, on ourselves and our own society. I guess... Um, got to show people sad stuff and get them to 
feel something if they're ever going <laughs> to believe, believe in a cause. <laughs> <laughs> when will uh when will people be able to clamp their eyes on that? Uh so that will be released uh for International Polar Bear Day end of February. Oh, so yeah. soon, soon, soon. Yeah. soon. Yeah. Oh, so Next fact, well, we might we might have to get this out uh Imminently, though. Yeah, you, you, time yours, yours might have to be the, the next one out. Yeah. You just got fast-tracked. Yeah. Or just in Bumped case it comes out before you guys put this out, it was released. <laughs> <laughs> it was For International released. Polar Bear Day, and you can now watch it. Where will it be? Just mm. on, online on YouTube? or? I'm not entirely sure, actually. The production company, Snapped, is working on distribution. We will speak plan, to you, and we'll make sure our listeners know how to watch it. Yeah. Because they will be interested. It'll be online. Yeah, definitely. Um, it was uh, supported by Canada Goose, so they'll be distributing it, and then we'll probably also be distributing it with some with some partners. As well. What is uh, in the water for you next, project wise? It's kind of, it seems kind of hard to top what you've been telling us for the last thirty <laughs> minutes because there's such incredible projects that are yeah. done, going to be released soon. Well, my next um, my next project is going to be a. Uh, uh, more of a personal labor of love um, that I've been actually working on now for uh, several years. Uh, but uh, the story will detail um, my family story, uh, Alex's story, um, the story of his and Conrad's friendship, uh, my mom and Alex's life together, um, each and my brother myself and my brother's relationship with Alex and then looking at his death and how it impacted us in different ways. Uh, and then kind of, kind of brought to the surface by this whole experience that, uh, we had in spring of 2016 when Alex's body was, um, discovered melted from the glacier, uh, that he was buried in, uh, in 1999. Wow. Um, by two climbers who were attempting to climb the same peak that they were trying to climb when he died. Um, and our whole family went back and uh, recovered Alex's body and his partner who was killed with him, David's body, uh, and put them to rest. And that was kind of the impetus for me wanting to take this on and take this experience that I had personally and mesh it with these experiences that... Uh, I had had telling stories and finding so much meaning in that and understanding in and in looking into how these powerful things impact people and kind of taking those tools that I have garnered from myself and pointing them back at myself and my family um, to maybe try and understand this whole event a little bit more and through that our lives. It's an incredibly, incredibly unique story. And it, it, it can't have been, or it, I mean, you're not quite finished it yet, but it can't have been an easy task to undertake. Yeah. That when you're really starting to analyze it and break it down and, and stitch the story that you know all too well together as the director and person trying to show yeah. the story to the world. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky bit. I mean, it's um, it's tough to be in a story and look at it uh from the outside but uh it's also like the most amazing in-depth therapy you could ever uh. <laughs> bestow upon yourself because you're thinking about the darkest things that you could dig into uh as a director the things that are going to bring emotion to your story but then also having to think about the implications of what that looks like and talking about those things in public and yeah. putting your family and the people that are closest to you in life through talking about those things. How is the, your sort of extended family, what was their reaction when you said you wanted to, you wanted to tell a story? Was everybody on board? Uh, I mean, I started shooting it when we went to Tibet and had that whole experience together. And um, yeah, I mean, our, our lives have always been, told as stories yeah it's fairly in some regard public. i mean meru told part of that story um a handful of other films about conrad and alex over the years i mean there was a film 
about Alex's death uh, released the year after he passed away. That was put out by the North Face and NBC Sports. And so our we've always been under the microscope. And uh, so I, I think when I brought up the idea of taking this thing that had defined us, the story that had defined us and been told by so many people from the outside and telling our perspective on this this crazy happenstance that you know has just kind of become part of all of us in a lot of ways um yeah my family were all pretty open to it well, not to say they aren't <laughs> a little bit <laughs> nervous about what the whole process is going to be like. And Good thing they trust you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For now. Well, it's going to be uh, incredible. It's going to be incredible. Are we looking at uh, years still, or is it months until yeah, people might be able um, to enjoy that? 2020, probably. Uh, we'll probably shoot for a 2020 festival release. and then. Well, you're going to have to be held to it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've just announced a date. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'll be very, very exciting. And is that going to take up like most of your time in your immediate future? Or Yeah, it's going to take up a good majority of the next year of my life, for sure, and probably more than that. Um, but uh, I'm sure I'll be doing some other stuff in the meantime. Now, was one thing that I, I wanted to ask you about, which um, Tyler and I had talked about yeah, probably when you were visiting, Tyler. In uh, when were you over? Mm, that was November second. Uh, November. Yeah, November. First two weeks of November. Which was the although you, you're saying that you did a lot of uh, fishing when you were you were younger, and I mm-hmm. hope that you managed to carry on fishing. Yeah, being a passionate fisherman myself, uh, hunting is a much newer thing to you. Yeah. How did uh, what made you pick up a rifle or a bow or however you started hunting for the first time? Um. Well, I mean, Alex had grown up hunting, both. My mom, Jennifer, and Alex grew up in Missoula, Montana, which is three and a half hours west of here, where we are in Bozeman. And uh, Alex had grown up hunting with his his brothers and his dad. And uh, when he passed away, I mean, I was 11, so he had taken me out a couple times, but uh, it wasn't really any, anything that I had ever gotten to experience with him as as a as a man. Uh, to to his father and um, yeah uh, it, it had always kind of piqued my curiosity just because especially in recent years um, you know the idea because I do eat meat the idea of going out and seeing what that experience was to harvest my own animal um, you know it was something that I that I was curious about uh, experiencing and felt like maybe a responsible thing to do i mean if you're gonna partake in an act you know in this modern day and age we're so far removed from our food systems the way we just go and buy things in the grocery store that detached is <laughs> completely detached from the natural world and i mean i uh, i cherish very much being able to go out and catch a fish and feed myself you know that was something that I learned from my mom and her father and um so taking that into hunting uh, and it being this thing that um had been in my family on my dad's side and then also that curiosity kind of uh led me to want to um do my first hunt this year and finally get hunter safety done because I was just couple years shy of the grandfathered in not having to take hunter's safety in Montana. Is Uh, that just, is that a requirement? Yeah. So I think anyone born after 1985 has to take a hunter safety course. Okay. Yeah. Is it, what does what what does that entail? Because it's not something that exists at home. It's an online course, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if, did you have to do a field day? In Montana you do. Yeah. 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 Prove that you can shoot a target. Yeah. That you're not, yeah. Pointing guns at people, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and so I I ended up doing that, and um, I only hunted for one day, but I ended up going out and 
uh, shooting some birds uh, on a friend of mine's land um shot a couple ducks and some pheasant and then uh ended up going that same afternoon and uh getting my first whitetail deer all in one day yeah Yeah, it was a nice (laughs) buck too it was a good buck yeah yeah and uh that's not a bad start to taking up hunting yeah yeah Yeah, it was a good deal it was it was a good day and i mean uh, i definitely feel like i didn't really get to experience a hunt because my friend has a lease on some farmland from a friend of his and we just went out and wandered around for four or five hours just ended up shooting a buck and just dragging it back to the truck just envisioning more like hiking 10 miles into the back country and that'll come it yeah, yeah. Out. that'll but come yeah yeah it was it was uh it was crazy yeah it was it was powerful and uh scary and was it everything really cool. you hoped it would be in terms of what you wanted to get out of it? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's like anything, um, you know, while you're doing something, even if it's the most impactful, crazy thing you've ever done, like you don't really understand the full implications of it. it takes time. Um, but yeah, in retrospect, yeah. It's really cool. It's really cool that that's even an option, that you can still go out and hunt stuff here and feed your family. I mean, in a lot of places in the U.S., people are so detached from wilderness and being able to uh, hunt and scavenge for food that, you know, they have no understanding of it. But for a lot of families here in Montana, that's how they manage to feed their kids and their family. It's a big I mean, part of the cult, the culture here. You shoot an elk, and that's you know, three grand worth of meat that you don't have to pay yeah. for to feed your kids all winter long. We just piled a bunch of elk at Tyler's house back into his freezer. <laughs> yeah, there was yeah. a lot of meat there. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a huge part of life in this part of the country. Um, I'm just partaking in that and feeling that connection to both my history in my family as well as the history and culture of this place that I have grown up and called home for so long. It was pretty awesome. Really beautiful thing. You, the reason why we were talking about this when, when Tyler was over was that you posted a picture of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you got a little bit of a a negative backlash to some (laughs) extent from, uh, I mean, I suppose most of the people who follow you on social media follow you for, cool adventures amazing photography the films that you've made yeah and that to that point in your life hadn't been part of it and then suddenly hey i went and killed something because i'm going to put it in my freezer yeah Which probably I, i'm guessing from the reaction <laughs> some people caught some folks off guard yeah it definitely caught some folks off guard i think and caused quite a stir and i mean that's fine but you, you weren't know, bothered if, if you don't want to see pictures of dead animals on your instagram feed i understand that for sure and I don't know. I, I I totally love the the ability that I have to engage with people through my photography on Instagram, but it's also a, an expression of myself, and um, it was something that I felt was powerful and important in my story, and um, yeah, it prompted discussion, and I think that controversy. Uh, leads to growth. Discussion is a good thing. <laughs> it's great for engagement. <laughs> and, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, radical backlash. People just, just um, calling me names and saying they probably hope you would die. Me and uh, yeah, saying mean things about my dead father and that sort of stuff. But. Uh, that's just the internet, and I just try not to take anything too too personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't because you, can't. Yeah. You, you those kind of people. There's no rationalizing with them. Yeah, I and think, I, mean, so I think they they enjoy I, being. Mean. I feel like anyone on that thread who commented, um, and I sat down with them like we are now and and talked about it rationally and explained ourselves and our backgrounds like 
there's no one out there that I don't think you could be friends with if you had a conversation and had a beer and just talked about the background of your lives and where you come from because we're all different and there's no way you can hold your pri- like expectations and and judgment of the world that you exist in to anyone else you know even someone who lives next door to you much less someone who lives in another part of the country or the world from you so but it doesn't stop people <laughs> well, <laughs> i i was in edinburgh scotland the day before they came to pick me up when you posted that photo and i remember we had just gotten back may or may not have been sampling some scotch and seeing that and remember reading some of the comments and you know my first instinct is to start throwing darts back right so i responded to a few but try to do that in a sensible diplomatic way there because you can kind of see the people who are just so far beyond any sort of rational thought they're just acting emotional and hateful and there's no reason in trying to have a sensible conversation with them but yeah. the few that i read who were coming from a place either from misunderstanding or ignorance of, like you said, your background and your family's history and your personal situation, um, tried to chime in on a few. Um, who knows if it's futile, but I think you guys would probably agree that when you when you see an engagement like that, it's not necessarily the people you're responding to, it's the people who are then going in and reading, reading these comments. Reading afterwards, yeah. And mm-hmm. they're reading the context of this and seeing what people say. And they might say. never contribute. Exactly. To those people, yeah. 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 It is what it is. That's fine. Has has it? <laughs> just, Instagram have, is I'm, just Instagram. I'm going to have you respond to my comments from <laughs> yeah. now. On. Yeah. Once that was sort of done and dusted in the past, has it come up again, or not? Like no. without prompting? No. No, not really. Until you go and hunt, bunch, do your next hunt. A bunch of people unfollowed me and whatever. It's, <laughs> they're you know that's fine. It's their prerogative. Um. Yeah, I don't know if I would post another like me with a dead animal photo. I mean, it, I that was like something I did because it was this powerful experience that I had never had before and it had a lot of meaning to me. And I think I may continue hunting. I don't know in what regard. Um, and I'll definitely continue fishing. And, you know, I think living off the land here in Montana is something that is that I admire greatly and that I would like to make a part of my life for the rest of my life. But, uh, yeah. And I, and I may tell hunting stories going forward, but I don't think, uh, I don't post very many photos of myself just in general at all. So. It tends to be stuff that you've taken. <laughs> yeah, photos of. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if I was going to post any more photos about hunting, it would probably be stories about other people, hopefully having some experience beyond just hunting. Well, Maybe tapping into something else via hunting and those experiences that come with it. Well, that is very much most of the conversations <laughs> that we have, isn't it, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. yeah. With you and through uh, through Modern Huntsman. Yeah. Well, and not to spill the beans, but we're going to be working with Max on hopefully adapting his polar bear story <laughs> into a uh, context of our next water Modern Huntsman issue. So, so. Perfectly flowed that in there. Yeah. 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 Almost like it was planned. Hmm. <laughs> Max, it's been awesome to have a chat with you. I've really enjoyed uh, I enjoyed spending some time with you in Yellowstone, and now we're about to go and cook up some hard-earned meat yeah. in your kitchen. Or actually, are you are we are we cooking outside? Is yeah, what, yeah, we are. Yeah. Okay, even better in the yeah. snow. Yep. Throw some burgers on the grill here. Now I'm gonna make some sweet potato fries. Yeah, <laughs> you do. Yeah, you the really controversy been, of the you sweet. really been claiming on your sweet potato fries. <laughs> yeah, I am skeptical. Actually, you know, you always need to undersell it, right? When we were in the the shop, Tyler was like, fuck that, we're not buying them. (laughs) (laughs) It's all coming out now. Yeah, I told Katie, she shook her head, and then you, I can make really crispy sweet potato fries. I'm like, great, that's what we're doing. Now I'm doubting myself. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like whenever I bake my own sweet potato fries, they're in there and they're just like soggy and just wet. You got to do it at over 400, and you got to leave them in there. For a little while, I'll like leave 20, them in there. Twenty-five minutes. Yeah, yeah. you've been rushing it. You got to well, give them the, the time. Of yeah, a crispy sweet potato fry will be the next episode. Mm, yes, <laughs> not too many, uh, too much oil either. Recipes to follow. <laughs> yeah. Gents, it's been a great evening. I am uh, in need of another beer and food. So, with that, we'll close the podcast. But thank you. Cheerio. Thanks for listening to the show. Don't forget 
if you want to follow us or, or email us or anything like that, then head over to our website. It's thepacebrothers.com. The email is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. Our Instagram is pace underscore brothers. Thank you to all of the new followers. We just reached 20... 20,000, 21,000, something like that. I was looking the other day. So thank you for all the, the new followers on, on there. If you would like to order any of our products, that's also on the website. And like I said before, if you want to find out anything else about Max, then head over to his social media pages or his website. If you are a new listener to the show, and like I say on most other shows, I actually got an email last week about the best app. Again, uh, since we started the show, we, we get emails about you know the best way to listen, not just to our show, to other podcasts. And we always direct people to either the native app that is on your Apple phone, which uh, if you've got an Apple phone, I don't think you can even delete it. It's the purple one. If you do not use an Apple phone, or even if you do, because you can get most of them on the Apple phones, we point people towards Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, Podcast Addict. They're some of the, the big ones out there. They're all free to use. And I'm pretty sure with Spotify, as we've said before, you can sign up and you don't you need to put your credit card on and you'll get some free music as well, which is pretty cool. I use Spotify. In fact, I now use Spotify to listen to podcasts on my Apple phone instead of the Apple Podcast app, um, just because I find it easier when I'm in the car driving. Join us again in two weeks' time. I'm not 100% sure who the next guest is, but I imagine it'll be someone from Africa. <laughs>